Take your Bible, if you would, tonight. Turn over to the book of Philippians. If you go to Philippians chapter 3. If you find your place there in Philippians chapter 3, I hope you are, of course, praying about our building. I mentioned that, of course, this morning, and we are just kind of day to day. We're still, uh, we've waited this long, had a number of obstacles, so you say, well, a couple of weeks don't really matter, and it doesn't. It's just logistically, it would be nice if we could hit our target, but if we don't, the Lord knows that, and uh, I'm glad that I didn't announce uh, maybe two years ago we were going to be in it. Uh, I think I did announce that two years ago we were going to be in January, but I meant January of 2021, okay? Uh, so the Lord knows all about the, uh, the obstacles, and certainly it's a blessing that uh, we need the building. We're thankful that we've got uh, a need for space, and just trust the Lord will give us that opportunity. But I do want you to pray about it, not take it for granted. Um, we don't even want to take for granted that we'll be in it in February. We want to just pray that God will open doors and we'll continue to move forward, and uh, trust that'll be the case. As you find your place in Philippians chapter 3, I want to read a text here from this chapter. So let's uh, have a word of prayer, and then we'll begin. Lord, we are thankful tonight that we can be here in this service. Lord, we're thankful that you've given us the ability to meet, that, Lord, we have freedom to come together, certainly with all the different challenges we've had over this previous year. It's a blessing that uh, we can meet without... uh, any kind of a difficulty other than just a few uh, spread out chairs. And we trust that you continue to keep us hedged about from any kind of uh, issue, especially a disease that would keep us from meeting. But Lord, we pray tonight in these moments, it's all we really have promised to us, that you would open up the word of God to us, that we might leave with our hearts challenged, that Jesus would be magnified, that you might receive the glory for all that's done. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. In Philippians chapter 3, the chapter begins like this, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Now, he goes on to say a number of things that we'll look at, but I want you to skip all the way down to verse 10, and notice after he tells these people to rejoice, gives his testimony, then Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, be it made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now, of course, the theme of the book of Philippians is joy. We find Paul continues to bring it up about joy and now actually exhorts them to rejoice in the Lord. He's going to do that again before the book is over. He says as he exhorts them to do this, he goes on and gives some some of his own testimony as to how he has achieved that joy that he's talking about. And he really brings down to the to the emphasis that he wants to bring to these people that the joy comes for a particular emphasis that he's made. That is something that he has sought for, something that he's looked for, has given him this joy. What is the most important aspect of your Christian life? Now, there's many ways we might state it, but let's just think about some of the things that we maybe try to attain in our life. Certainly an emphasis that we'd want in our church, an emphasis we want in our life is to try to win people to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is, we have been given a mandate. It is important that we be a witness. We know that the last commission that Jesus gave, and certainly a focus, we know that we're saved, and if folks are lost, they're lost for eternity. So it is important in our Christian life that we be a witness. But let me say, as important as that is, I believe what I'm going to show you tonight is even more important. You know, I think holy living is important in the life of a Christian. I think we ought to have a strong testimony. It ought to be that the world looks at a Christian and sees that there's some uh, heavenly power, something different, something about their life that is noticeable, that our light is shining, and it does come by being different from the world. Certainly, holy living in our life is important, but I believe what we're going to look at tonight is more important than that. You know, giving is part of our Christian life. God's told us to give. We know the tithe belongs to the Lord. We know that New Testament giving is give as God has prospered you. You never have to uh, pull and tug. And a person who's right with the Lord, they know that, yes, God's given to me, and I want to give back. And giving is important. And you can't believe a Baptist preacher is going to say this, but what I'm going to show you tonight is much more important than giving. You see, there's many parts of our Christian life that we could talk about that are all important. In fact, it's important to honor the Lord and to please God in all things He's commanded us to do. But what I'm just going to show you and what Paul is getting at tonight, if we get this right, the rest of it will fall in place. 
Because what Paul is telling these believers, rejoice in the Lord, and then he goes on to say, walk with God. You know, that's what he meant when he said that I may know him. He didn't mean I'm trying to be saved. He was already saved. He didn't say I'm trying to learn how to get to heaven. He was already on his way. But he said, the passion of my life, the thing that drives me is that I may know him. Hey, was Paul a soul winner? We know Paul said, I am pure from the blood of all men. Not many of us could make that statement. Did Paul believe in living a holy life? He said, I have lived of all good conscience. I mean, his conscience was clear before God and before man. I mean, Paul had given himself. He had surrendered himself. But he said, when I think of the passion of my life, I want to know him. You know, we start walking with God. And what God does is begins to produce through us these aspects of the Christian life. Now, I notice several things here as I look at this passage. When we think about walking with the Lord, Paul, no doubt, wants these people to reach that point, so he deals with the hindrances to the walk. Now, Paul makes some positive points that reminds me of perhaps some pitfalls. Look, if you would, in chapter 3 and verse 1 again. It says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Now, as he often did, he was shooting at a particular group here, because just about everywhere Paul went, when he laid the foundation, when he started a church, there would be the Judaizers who were following the Jewish law, who maybe would admit that Jesus was the Messiah, but obviously they were interested far more in keeping the law than they were in knowing Jesus. And of course, they had to, in some sense, follow what Paul had said. But they came in and said, look, Paul just introduced you to the Messiah. We've got to tell you how to become a good Christian. Now, the way you become a good Christian in their mind was to be a good Jew. You keep the law, you keep these rules, you keep these regulations. And of course, he's talking, they're talking to Gentiles. The Gentiles had no background in this, knew nothing about it. This had been settled in the book of Acts. That they, of course, were delivered from the law. But they came in and said, it's so much easier to keep rules and so much easier to keep regulations because then you'll know you can track your progress. You know, human beings are made that way. We like rules and regulations in a sense because we feel pretty good. Look how well I've kept them. Look what I've done. Paul said, don't be confused by false religion because false religion will not lead you to a walk with God. Now, he's not talking to lost people. He's talking about people that knew the Lord, but he said, don't be confused by the concision. The dogs, don't be confused by these Judaizers. What did they basically do? They came in and told these Christians who had been saved by the grace of God, just like over in the book of Galatians, he deals with in the whole book. They came in and said, okay, you're saved. But if you want to be the right kind of Christian, well, you've got to keep the Sabbath day. If you want to be the right kind of Christian, you can't eat certain meats. If you want to be the right kind of Christian, you've got to observe these feast days and so forth. Now, every one of those were fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. They were simply a ritual for a time to point people to Jesus. And, of course, they had been fulfilled. And so Paul is saying, listen, keeping rules and elementary elements isn't going to get you any closer to God they were trying to use the flesh to try to become what they ought to be. You know, he reminded them over in Galatians chapter 3, verse 3. He says, what? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? But notice the contrast now. He says, don't listen to them. But here's what he says in verse 3. For we are the circumcision. Now, that term, of course, was the term that a Jew would use to, as the sign of the covenant. So he's kind of a play on words. He's, the Christian does not claim this, but he's saying we are the religious crowd, and our religion is like this, which worship God in the Spirit, which, by the way, is how Jesus told us to worship Him, right? In Spirit and in truth. We worship Him in Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Now, certainly Paul is emphasized this, and he's going to get to this point, and certainly it's true in the Christian life. We ought to live a definite way. Our life ought to be different. There ought to be holy principles in our life that are manifest because Jesus saved us and made us a new creature. I mean, you take it to the extreme, a man that's a drunkard, he gets saved, you expect God to change some actual actions that he does. 
a person lives an immoral life and they're saved, you expect to see a change. That's in an extreme way, but it's also true for all of us. There's some definite things that ought to begin to change in our life. But now, when you live and institute what we would call a holy life, your instituting a holy life does not help you walk with God. Walking with God will help you institute a holy life. Don't get the cart before the horse. Now, how does false religion do this? Well, again, we can take two extremes. You've got, on the one hand, uh, folks that we would even agree with that believe the gospel. Folks that would say you are saved by grace. Some people preach grace and practice law. But here's maybe on the one hand, we would immediately recognize as not biblical. We'd say, okay, here's a person who's uh, preaching the gospel that you're saved by God's grace. But to them, anything goes. There's absolutely no place for preaching against sin. You just can't dictate to anybody in the sense of uh, sharing God's word and principles that something's wrong. It's every man for himself. After all, we have, quote, liberty in Christ, and they uh, determine that to be liberty to do wrong. I mean, I've got liberty to just live whatever I want to. And you know churches today that obviously if we ask them, they claim to believe the gospel. But on the other hand, they have just no difference at all from the world. Now, the Bible does say, be not conformed to this world. I mean, that's a definite principle in the Bible. But they say, well, you know, that's just very subjective. And, you know, what is the world anyway? Well, yeah, we'd recognize that and say, well, that's going to be a hindrance to the walk. If I'm following the world, that's going to hinder my walk. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But, you know, in contrast to that, there also can be someone. And again, these people may be well-meaning. They may have good intentions. I would stand to say Paul had good intentions when he was lost. You know, he thought he was doing right when he killed Christians. He thought he was honoring God when he held men and women to prison. But intentions aren't good enough. They may think, well, we don't want to turn people off. We want people to feel more comfortable. We don't want people to feel like they're in bondage. Just let them do what they want to do, and the Holy Spirit will lead them. Well, the Holy Spirit will lead you to follow this book. But then on the other hand, here's some people, again, very well-intentioned, and they look at maybe the, uh, that type of a, a libertarian type life and say, no, we're going to go the utter opposite direction. And they do have the intention of trying to live right and different from the world, but they get the cart before the horse. To them, there's a list. Now, these things in this list, we might even agree with. They say, we believe God is interested in how a person dresses. And by the way, God is interested in how people dress. So they come up with a definite standard for dress. Nothing wrong with a standard. Then they say, well, we know that God is certainly pleased in a certain way that we fix our hair. So, and God is interested in how you fix your hair, by the way. There's a wrong way and a right way, but there's a big group, uh, bit of latitude in that. Thank the Lord. Okay. But there's some obvious things the Bible talks about. Uh, we know that it's possible, for instance, that a woman could dress in such a way that her whole focus is on her outward appearance. And the Bible condemns that in first Timothy in the book of second Peter. So they come up with a standard. Here's how I'm going to dress. Uh, we're just going to get rid of makeup altogether. No gold, no apparel, and so forth. We're going to get rid of all of this, and uh, we've got this list of rules for women. For the men, here's their list of rules. Now, don't get me wrong. We might agree in principle with some of that list, but they feel very confident in that list. I've kept my list. I mean, I dress this way, talk this way, don't do this, don't do that, and there's my top ten, but they don't walk with God. That list won't help you walk with God. But you know what happens? You start walking with God. You're going to have as much liberty as anybody could have in Christ. You're not going to feel in bondage at all. It's going to be a joy to serve him. And God's going to produce for you, if they're biblical, the standards you ought to have in your life. He's going to deal with you. Now, I think about a, a, a woman. I read a story one time. She was married to a, to a fellow. He was really an overbearing type husband. And he laid down on her uh, some pretty tight things and kind of demanded of her almost like wait on him hand and foot type thing. You know, he expected everything to be done on time. When he got there, you've got to do this. You've got to have my supper ready at a certain time, have my shoes at the door when I get ready to go out. You know, when I come out of the uh, bathtub, there better be a towel in the right place. I mean, whatever it might be. Some of you say, well, what was the problem with that? But anyway... Uh, <laughs> He was sort of overbearing, you know, and put this thing down on his, on, his, on his wife. So for a number of years, she really wasn't all that happy, but she stayed faithful to this man, and he died. Well, she, not too long after, a couple of years later, married another man. The marriage was much different. This man was a far more uh, gracious type man. He, she had never experienced it before, but he 
loved her as it were as Christ loved the church and really demonstrated what a husband ought to be. And you know, he never demanded her of any of those things. He never put down certain expectations in the way this other husband did. And of course, it was much different for her. She wasn't used to it. And she thought, boy, I just never realized this is what uh, a marriage could be like. And she was enjoying it. And it hit her one day after they'd been married for two or three years. You know what she did? She always had his supper ready on time. Always had his shoes at the door. Always had his towel. I'm just saying these things. that Basically, everything she did for the other husband, because she had to, now she didn't have to, she did it anyway, because he loved her. Now, some of you are going to get home and have a discussion over this, I understand. But anyway, <laughs> let me know how it turns out, okay? <laughs> I'd like some advice. But anyway, uh, you understand the point is, many times a person who maybe approaches it wrongly, a person who gets the cart before the horse, the person who has the list and says, well, if I do these 10 things, I'm living a holy life and that's what God expects of me. I might look at it and say, well, I respect the fact that you're living a good life. But you know what happens is the person who walks with God, he's not focused on the list. He's focused on the Lord and God begins to do those things. I do it because I love him. I do it because I rejoice in the Lord. And of course we have liberty. Now we're liberated by Jesus to do right. So he is, he is focusing here on that one aspect, have no confidence in the flesh. You know, I'm not good enough to live a good enough life. I don't have the ability in myself to live the exemplary life that God puts down on me, but Jesus does. I get out of the way and let him live through me. Paul is emphasizing to these people, have no confidence in the flesh. Now, that is the hindrance. But now notice the essence of the walk. He moves a little further down here. And of course, he talks about where he was at and how he had been uh, such an exemplary religious person in verses 4 through 6. But then notice in verse 7, he says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. You know, it was almost like a club with Paul. He was in the Pharisee club. They came up with things to make them more religious. In other words, it wasn't enough even just to follow the law. Somebody says, well, I'm a faithful tither. That's what the Pharisees would do. Man, I tithe faithfully. Well, somebody would say, oh, really? Well, what do you tithe? Oh, well, I tithe all my income. They said, well, that's nothing. I tithe my income. I started tithing my spices. If I have so many pieces of anise and cumin, I'll count them out. And I'll give 10 of those to God. What do you think of that? Well, somebody else says, well, what do, you do? Uh, what do you do? I fast every week, one day a week. Well, he says, oh, you think that's the case? I fast twice in the week and give tithes of all that I possess. You see, it was a club and a contest. You know who won the contest? Paul. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He had attained the religious uh, outward appearance, and everybody respected him for that. He said, when I got saved, those things that I counted wonderful, he said, I counted them nothing for Jesus. Amen. Walking with him was far greater than that. You want to see who had been to the high of the religious spectrum. Paul had been there, but what is the essence of the walk? You know what he had to do first of all? He had to relinquish his rights. He had to realize what God wants is more important than what I want. What men think of me. You know, often when we talk about the fear of man, we think of it in the sense that I've got to please God because man wants me to sin. But you know, the same thing's true with the religious crowd. I've got to please God, not the religious crowd. There's only one person that I have to please, and it's him. Um, if my motive is simply, boy, I better do this because the preacher knows about it, or I better do this because this Christian person is watching me, I'm far more concerned that I don't want to do this because the world is watching me. Not what the preacher thinks and what the church member thinks. My testimony really is before the world. And I'm supposed to please God. So he relinquished. You go on and read in verse 8. He says, Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Now, he relinquished what he had before, because he weighed it out and he says, here's what it looks like. You know, when he, uh, he himself had these religious elements, you know really what that was? That was his God. 
He had confidence in himself. He said, I can do this. When he came to Christ, he said, you know what? I put all this stuff behind me and I counted it as dung. Now, maybe your uh, idol is not a religion. Maybe your idol is something else. But you know, as a believer, anything that we set up above him, any high place we set up, anything that we set up that takes precedent over him, we've got to, just like Paul, we've got to relinquish it. We've got to say, God, there's nothing more important than walking with you. Now, you know what? Sometimes God gives us some of that stuff back, doesn't he? But he needs the title deed to everything we own. And if he determines, as we're just his steward, if he determines to take away the enjoyment of that thing, he's God. We've got to give it to him. Now, Paul relinquished all of that and gave it to the Lord. He relinquished it and he repented. And then he even talks about his salvation. He says in verse 9, says, being found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that just, which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. You know, what is the essence of the walk here? How is a person going to walk with God? Well, you know how it starts. Salvation begins through faith in Christ. Galatians 2.16, very similarly, Paul writes to the Galatians with a similar issue. They, of course, are trying to use the law to, to gain their walk with God. And he says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. In other words, he's illustrating his own walk by saying, look, when I came to Christ, I didn't do it by the works of the law. I didn't do it by a list. Now, do you know walking with God happens just like salvation? It's faith. I trust God. I put my faith in him. I trust him. He already lives inside of me. I just got to trust him and let him come out. Now, he relinquished his rights. He repented before God, and he knew where his righteousness came from. What is righteousness? Well, we think of righteousness, of course, as right living. And that is true. God leads us in the paths of righteousness. We, a righteous life is a, an exemplary life because righteousness means meeting your obligation. You know, the book of Proverbs talks about a scale being righteous. It's not moral. It meant it met its obligation. You weigh something out, it's supposed to weigh two pounds, and it said it did, then it's righteous. It met the, well, we are by nature unrighteous. Jesus has imparted unto us his righteousness. Now think about it. He has put in me his life. It's inside. By faith, I've received him. I didn't receive a religion. I received a person. That righteousness was not attained by a list. It wasn't attained by going down and trying to uh, dot the I's and cross the T's. It was I repented and I turned to him. Paul said, now you know how you got started. That's how you keep going. You begun in the spirit, walk in the spirit. And he says, my desire, my goal is that I may know him. Well, how are we going to know him? Well, he talks about the cultivation of the walk. Look, if you would, now in verse 10. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. Now, I see, first of all, in this, the, the cultivation of the walk is recognizing the power. That I may know the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering. Now, the Bible tells us over in Galatians, again, chapter 2, well-known verse, verse 220, but think about it if you would. I am crucified. That's death. I want to be made conformable to his death. I am crucified with Christ. Well, does that mean it's over? Does that mean you're dead? No, I'm crucified with Christ. He rose, I rose. Nevertheless, I live. And not I, but Christ liveth in me. Now, you think about it, because it's, 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 it's deep, and it's certainly uh, familiar to us, but the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, I've got to be conformable to his death. Jesus died for sin. This point is made in a number of Paul's epistles, but it's just difficult, and, it, and it's repeated because we just can't catch it when we receive Christ we died with him on the cross. I mean, it's no longer me. I'm out of the picture. I'm in Christ. That's why a person that can't grasp this struggles maybe even knowing he's saved. 
well, I trusted Christ, God, God wiped clean my slate, but oh man, I just said a word I shouldn't have said. Does that mean I'm lost again? You can't be lost. You're in Jesus. Well, I got saved and God wiped away all my sins, but man, I just went out and I didn't even, before I knew it, I had lied to somebody. Am I lost now? Well, you've got to deal with your father. You've got some things you need to get right, but you can't be lost. You're in Christ. Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 3.3, you're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. You know, if I recognize, first of all, my position in him that I have been placed in Jesus and Jesus is in me, we are vitally united. He is God. Now that's power. You know how I cultivate my walk? Is first of all, just recognizing I'm in him. Now, he said, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. Now, of course, the power of his resurrection, how powerful is that? I mean, Jesus raised himself from the dead. You know, I look back in the Old Testament. I remember Elisha. He uh, died and his bones were in a grave. And a man fell in there, uh, injured, died, touched Elisha's bones, and he got up. That was impressive. But Elisha didn't do it. He was dead. God did it. He just used Elisha's bones. Jesus, of course, uh, broke up every funeral he ever attended. Here they come through town with a little dead boy on a beer, all the mourners behind. They had a perfectly good funeral planned out, and Jesus broke the whole thing up. He met the boy, got him up. They had it all planned out with Peter's mother-in-law. He's thinking, finally. And then she, he comes in and raises her up, and it's all over. I mean, every funeral he ever... And then, of all things, they finally put him to death... And there's nobody on this earth anywhere to raise him. Of course, God in heaven, but he raises himself from the dead. How powerful is that? God said that power has been implanted in me in a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's power. Hey, I can walk with God because God provides the power. You know, he also gives us the perspective on perfection. You'll notice now verse 11, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. Now, Paul had realized that the Christian life is an ongoing walk. I mean, Paul lived a pretty straight life. I mean, he was pretty effective as a Christian. His testimony was pretty vibrant. He said, I am, uh, live with all good conscience before God and man. I, as far as I know, everything's right. But he said, I'm still moving and working on my life. You know, there's no colder Christian than a Christian who thinks he's arrived. The Christian who thinks he has attained. I mean, if you really stop and look at yourself and think, well, I just don't know that I could be any more spiritual than I am, well, then you, that's a good place to start right there, you know, humility. I mean, we have all got a long way to go. And you know why God allows us to have that ongoing need in our entire life is because we need to depend on him. I mean, if, what if God let us reach that point? Okay, well, good. You've kept the list. You're there. I mean, that's pretty much, you've got every, the top 10 standards you're supposed to have, and you pretty well are able to do that. Well, of course, God looks beyond the external, doesn't he? He looks to the internal. And we all know that uh, we might be able to keep a good face on before everyone else, but inside, we need him every day. We need him every hour. And so Paul had the right perspective on perfection, but then I notice his passion. The second part of that verse, he says uh, that I were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which I also am apprehended of Christ Jesus. You know, let me think of it like this. I sure wish I could love him as much as he loves me. I mean, I wish that God would implant in me a love for God the way God loves me. Romans 5, 5, the love of God is shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Ghost. Now, is the love of God subjective or objective? That is, is it saying that the love of God is shed abroad? That is my love for him. Or is the love of God shed abroad his love for me? And the answer to the question is yes. The Holy Ghost does both of them. You know, he can help me love him. And he helps me understand his love for me. And he puts in his love for me, and when I love him, I begin to love others. That's taught throughout the Bible. Now, 
Paul had a passion. I love the way he puts this. I want, to, I want to apprehend that for which I am apprehended. You know, I wonder if we've lost our passion for a walk with God. Is it academic? Well, what does that mean? I need to read my Bible and I need to pray. Well, that's a good start. You find the power in this book and you go and ask God, and that is the the means, that is the path, that is the way you get to Him is through the truth He's given to you and your ability to communicate with Him through prayer. Certainly that is the path, but we need more than that. We need a passion. We need a passion, a desire, because when I go and I see in the Bible uh, verses like, if you seek me with all your heart, they shall seek me early and they shall find me. Early, of course, not just talking about the hour and the day, but first, putting Him above all else. You know, I speak from experience because I know how easy it is to get distracted. I'm not talking about distracted by sin. I'm talking about distracted by life. Life distracts us. I mean, all of us at some point need revival in our heart. I mean, we need to be stirred and reignited and get like Paul and say, I want to apprehend that which I'm apprehended for. So he talks about the passion. Then he talks about the past in verse number 13. I count myself not to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. You know what's important in a walk with God? Is to believe God forgives you. You know, sin is so bad, God hates it so much, that the devil will use that against you. He is an accuser of the brethren. If you're like me, you can just be ashamed of yourself sometimes. How can I be a Christian, be saved, and think that kind of thought? Or say something that mean? Or do something that selfish? Well, because you're a dirty, rotten sinner without Jesus. That's why. But you know what I have to recognize? If I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive me for my sin. Now, let me put uh, the old Frank Bailey uh, twist on that. If I ignore my sin, he won't forgive my sin and not be faithful to forgive me. I'm going to regard iniquity in my heart. If I ignore it and go on, yes, my walk's going to be hindered, but the other is equally true. You know, as a human, we often uh, see the human side of that and say, well, yeah, the emphasis there on is if I don't confess my sin, then I'm just not right with God. That is true. But notice the verse's emphasis is the other. If I confess, he forgives. You know what I need to do is believe God that he forgives. Don't listen to the devil. I've many times gone up to the pulpit to preach, and I've had the devil whisper in my ear, there's no way God's going to use you. Look at this sin in your life. Well, you know what? That, if I had the sin in my life, it'd be a problem. But I have to remind him, Jesus took care of that. Amen. That's under the blood. That's confessed. It's done with. He's not dealt with me after my sin, nor rewarded me according to my iniquity. And if I want to walk with God, don't listen to the devil. Listen to the Bible. He forgives my sin when I confess it. And then, of course, he uses as the motive the prize. He says, I press toward the mark for the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I'm not pressing toward the mark for my salvation. Not at all. He wants the prize, and that is a well done, thou good and faithful servant. He talks about the crown, five crowns mentioned in the New Testament. And those crowns, I mean, what do they really mean? They're, as far as a physical crown, I'm not going to explain away that maybe there's some physical crown that we literally can take and throw it at the feet of Jesus. But what would be the tremendous prize to go for is for Jesus to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen. So what is the most important aspect of my life now that I'm saved? That everything else flows from, that I might walk with God, Amen. that I might know him and know him better and let him live through me. Amen. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer.